and looking at like the model between like how they give you cards in the two games is just like night and day. So. Mm. Hurrah! Oh, we did it. Yeah, Are we we get there. Yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you. We'll we'll start this off with my tip to everybody. Yep. We is made that, it. Is we that, did it. Yeah, is that once you figure everything out with, with with YouTube, they go and change it on you, and they change the settings, yeah. and they mess <laughs> you around. They they love to keep you on your toes. I'll tell you that. I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Am I must. Go ahead. No, no. Uh, go ahead. You say yours first. You're a guest of Oh, honor. no. I was just going to say my son really wants to be a, a YouTuber, and I was trying to tell him about that. Like, that it's... Because uh, he thinks... You know, he's 16, so he's got it all figured out. Uh, yeah. Oh, of course. Uh, he knows everything. Yeah. But my kids don't understand how Ryan's toy review guy gets all the toys. That's... why. why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I watched some of those channels. I watched some of those, like, toy... Like, retro... G.I. Joe review channels and stuff. And they're always getting like packages from people across the world. And I'm like, okay, that's a great scam. I need to get on that. I need to start talking about like, yeah, I'm going to start reviewing toys. Please send me your toys that you're not using more that you've been keeping in your attic for like 30 years. Send them here. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we, we, we tried that with, uh, have you ever heard of this company called uh, fantasy flight games? We're like, <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, we have this YouTube channel. Send us some stuff. Guys, keep sending it. I get uh, uh, I get a lot of smiley emojis back from Evan, right? Like, hey, yeah. hey. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> We're happy to be diverse. Send us more stuff. Come on, uh, guys. Welcome to tune in for bad publicity. This is a very special uh, episode we have going on. Uh, even though this, he's been on the show for one minute and fifty two seconds. He's already a, oh. a full full friend. <laughs> Full friend of the podcast now, uh, Caleb. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your evening uh, to to spend with us. I hope we're not pulling you away from some late night design processes and stuff that you'll go in tomorrow and curse out. Yeah, no, actually, I had a flash of inspiration, but you guys totally killed it. Now, <laughs> <laughs> just imagine the set that's Excellent. never gonna get made. I'm <laughs> great. And, I'm told that's what we do best is kill inspiration on this show more, more than Skills. a dozen times. Yeah, it takes real skill to crush people like that, but we do it. We do it well in one minute and 52 seconds. <laughs> uh, so, you know, thank you very much again for taking the time out here. We're here to talk Marvel, um, but why don't, since this is your kind of first time here, uh, most people in the game world already know who you are. You've pretty much been or are... Are you the 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 longest tenure fantasy flight person there now? Well, on the on the living card game team, I am now. Um, nice. Nate French was the most senior member of the team uh, for the longest time, but now he's the uh, he's the new executive game designer at uh, Fantasy Flight Games. So you got a pretty big promotion. And that makes me the old fuddy-duddy in the room now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but nice. that, but you can come in and drop clout on anything now, right? Like just. Mm. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not even. <laughs> no, I'm I'm the uh, I'm the most uh, most senior guy on the team, but I'm I'm far from the most creative on the on the team. It's I work with a lot of really talented people, so there's I don't I don't feel I have a lot of clout to throw around. I, I look at the guys around me and I say. I got to keep up with them. Mm. <laughs> like, like I'm not. I'm on. I'm not even joking. Like, uh, you know, I work on the game with Michael Boggs, and he's super talented. I worked on Lord of the Rings with Matt Newman for a long time, who's just killing it on Arkham Horror now. Like, uh, you know, pretty much everyone in that room, you know, uh, from from start to finish, is just doing a super job. So no, I, I don't. I don't go around <laughs> trying to yeah. impress anybody on the team. Did that, yeah, stay stay humble. Yeah, stay humble. Did. <laughs> Um, so how how long have you been at Fantasy Flight now? Uh, it'll be nine years in September. So your personalized card does that appear in Lord of the Rings? It does. It yeah. does. I was uh, I was actually thinking I'd record upstairs, but I don't have uh, it's because I'm working from home now. So my office is 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 upstairs, and uh, I have my my work computer, um, but it doesn't have Skype on it. Mm. So I was like, oh, I gotta. 
got to go down to the basement and, you know, sit on my old laptop in the shadows. But uh, the reason I was thinking of it is because uh, I finally hung my, my five-year art, like, you know, <laughs> several years later. Uh, but it's finally up on the wall. And, uh, yeah, I was just like, what a treat. Uh, the Alexander Karks, he, he uh, illustrated my, my picture. I have this art of me as a ranger. And uh, he just knocked it out of the park. He just absolutely slayed, and it's amazing, and it makes me happy every day I look at it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. so awesome to have that, uh, you know, to hit that tenure and that, and that stat. Like, not many companies are able to do that, right? Like, put the people that work for them in the product when they've hit a certain, yeah. certain mark. Yeah, well, and but... it's, it's extra sweet when you're the game's lead designer, and you could decide what art that that uh what, what what card it goes on and you get to write the text and the title and all of it so i uh yeah we joked a lot about like oh you're just gonna make yourself totally overpowered just totally broken <laughs> just, just set up win the game you know um i didn't quite go that far but yeah it was fun <laughs> so is is your card then pretty much like one that is is like a power level max did you you know i remember that you know damon stone had a had a hit a funny story around his time when we talked with him back in the day about uh sure uh putting his in game of thrones and stuff or um that the, he had the mm -hmm. sorry the one in in, in netrunner and he had kind of uh that hint of dancing with damon hey, hey this you is my, my boy just wants to say good night this is Peter. Peter, you want to say hi to my friends there? Yeah, and then have my. <laughs> oh, and then my daughter's upstairs. And she says, "I do." <laughs> this should be done. She's on her way. <laughs> Peter, you're on, you're on a podcast that's going to be watched by ten people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's bedtime at our house, so he's just saying good night. Love you, kiddo. No, eat. Yeah, we'll go upstairs and eat. Uh, Mom will take care of you. Yeah. <laughs> Lucy's probably going to make her way down here next. Uh, yeah, my cards, it's powerful, but it's like niche. You know, um, it, it plays around with, uh, it, so I made myself an ally. The joke was like, oh, you should make yourself a hero, you know, in the game. And I was like, no, I, I don't want to be that guy. Someone opens up a pack like, oh, who's the hero in this pack? Really, Caleb? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to go that far, but I did the next best thing. I made myself an ally who can gain hero status when there's enough side quests that have been completed. <laughs> That's, so it, like, it, I can level up. <laughs> yeah. So are are you due for another one? Is it every five? No, I, I, I uh, so at ten years, um, we're offered a sabbatical, which is pretty cool. Huh. So uh, that's something to look forward to. Maybe take a trip with the family and do something like that. Finally, yeah. yeah, you can be like me. Finally, move out of your like the basement and like right, like get <laughs> get it, do do something. <laughs> uh. They, they let they let me out every once in a while, but yeah, this this whole lock lockdown work from home kind of situation these days. Yeah, we're we're all in, in the same boat. Yeah, yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting year to say the least. Uh, Corey, what do you got? We've handcrafted hey. a, a list working for the last month of highly skilled questions to to grill you with here. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. I mean, you already talked a little bit about, uh, you know, yourself, like with the company and everything. Um, is there any other things like with your background you want to bring up or like mention people may not be aware of, or might be something like school you want to like shout out about? I feel like I'm a very boring person. <laughs> hey, you know what? That's something. <laughs> most, yeah, the most interesting things about me are usually things that like, uh, you know, hard to talk about, like you know, like personal stuff. But uh, as far as like relates to being a game designer, um, we got asked this question. Um, oh yeah, on our last live stream mm -hmm. when we announced uh, the Galaxy's Most Wanted and some of the more uh, the new hero packs, and someone in the chat really wanted to know like how did we get into game design, and uh, and I kind of punted to Boggs because I really like his story. You know, like uh, he really impressed me when he talked about. Um, you know, how he started a whole game group in South Korea when he was, you know, working and living there. Like, he was so serious about doing game design that he he met other like-minded people and, like, made it a weekly thing. And I was like, wow, that's that's really cool, you know. Um, and so I, I, I often feel a little sheepish. Like I say, working with such talented people, sometimes I feel sheepish that uh, I, I never really thought about pursuing a, a career in game design that was never actually 
on my radar of something that I could do with my life. Um, but when I look back, if, if I'm honest about it, I start reflecting on this after I got that question. If I look back at my life, it actually feels like a straight line from, you know, where I can remember to where I am now. Like, I've always been interested in games. I just, like I said, I never thought about it in the context of pursuing a career. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I remember making my own board games and, and taking my notebook with me to uh, restaurants on my lunch break and jotting down game ideas. Like, I've always been into games. And then uh, it's just good fortune that the game company that I ended up with also has the licenses to, like, my favorite things. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. That's a pretty, that's Marvel, a pretty good... Uh, Star Wars. Yeah. Like, things that I grew up obsessing over, right? Like... Uh, one of my prized possessions from my from my youth is uh, the Marvel Series Three Trading Card Collection. I have the complete mint, near mint, you know, like collection, like in a binder, the old three ring binder from like 1992 or whenever it was. Like I still have that, and uh, it's funny to think like how I used to read the back of the card to learn about the characters. And, like, that's all, like, useful information now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, like, relevant to my career. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's so funny when you think about things like that, that, yeah, you know, as kids, you know, you're, there's, you know, Mario, Nintendo, like, all those games that we played, you know, Monopoly, like, the games back in the day when board games were just company names, right? Like Hasbro, Mattel, and the, and the designers kind of were buried somewhere, like, you know, who made Trivia Pursuit? Ah, well, you have to Wikipedia it because they never put them on the box. They Now this right. whole, you know, and you don't think about somebody has to work on all this stuff. And, you know, it's it's back in the day, it, it's really weird, you know, like our upbringing. You know, your mom's not getting you up in the morning and being like, you know, got to go to game design school and, and, and got to do all this stuff where you got to go and collect those comic books, Caleb. Like, you're going to need this one day. You're going to need this information. Someone's going to ask right. you in a job interview, in a board meeting, what villain should we put in the next expansion cycle? <laughs> right? So, it, and it's weird. And now we have, like, so many things out there that people don't think that our careers can be careers. And, and mm-hmm. I, I think it's really interesting when some people just organically kind of grow into it like that right because yeah you have the people you know like boggs that are very that their mind is really you know um you know that scene in uh what is it uh oh the hangover right when he's counting the cards and all the num- beautiful mind thing is going all <laughs> over the place right hey there's people out there that that see everything like life is a puzzle and there's some people that just can be like hey wouldn't this be a cool idea this What's is- cool about working with Boggs is when you sit near him, you can see it too. It actually <laughs> floats over his head. <laughs> Where like I can get inspired too. Like, oh, that's it right there. Yeah. Wait, that's- no, Boggs, rewind your thoughts. Rewind your thoughts. I didn't get it. <laughs> that's why he keeps the the beanies on back in the day, right? Keeps it all under there. <laughs> Traps it in. Yeah, but but you know, like I, I it, you know, being down there for back in the day when you guys, you know not this year, but like running worlds and our experiences with Netrunner, getting to meet all the designers. It's such a, an eclectic group of people, you know, it's not like, it's not like this is the mold of person that, that we're looking for to join our team. Right. It's like, it's like, I've seen a lot of people, like I was talking with people before. They're just like, Oh, how did you get to work for FFG? Oh, because I showed up every Wednesday night at, at Game Group, and I was talking with them, and then I met the designers, I was doing this, and then I got into organized play, and then I was testing more, and then I was testing more, and then I just, you know, got offered a job. And uh, it's it's just the love of the hobby has organically produced some, some great design team guys, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, y- you know him, but people on here don't know him. But, uh, you know, Jeremy Zorn, like, he was just somebody who was really good at card games at the beginning and then just played and played world champions, uh, shipped multiple titles. Guy just is comes up with some incredible ideas with some of the designs that you see him working on, right? But I don't think he ever sat down and was like, going to be a game designer one day. Maybe. Maybe he did, but... A L- little bit. I think a little bit more than me. He actually... Um... He, he showed me a game that he had been working on for a long time before he ever started at FFG. And it was, like, really well-developed. He had art and, and everything. 
like graphic design and everything like it was pretty near complete you know and i was like wow how long have you been working on this he's like oh for a while yeah so uh it, it's yeah, like musicians it's right about. musicians have their entire life to make that first album but then after you come out with your first sure. game people are like so what's next what's next <laughs> Caleb? You done, you done this game what's next uh, all right let's yeah, that's world champions so special this is the first time i got to be involved with the game at the start you know, nine years, almost nine years, sorry, at the company. So eight when I started working on on uh, Marvel or, or pretty near. Mm. And uh, I'd been on the same game. I started working on, on The Lord of the Rings in 2011. Yeah. Uh, and I'd just been on it until, you know, recently. Just, just <laughs> kept that truck right. along. Someone had so, to keep it up, right? Yeah, That's no, awesome, it felt man. really good. I'm really proud of the, mm. the what we did on that game, especially uh, even yesterday. I was on Facebook. I'm still a part of that uh, Lord of the Rings Facebook page. And someone just posted on there that they just got into the game and purchased all the Saga expansions. And they were so excited that they, they made it to Mount Doom and destroyed the One Ring yeah. and, and posted it up on Facebook. And I was like, that really makes me proud. Like That yeah. was something Christian Peterson said to me when, when we wrapped it up. You know, He approved the last... Uh, the last set. He's like, you know, you've made something now that's part of the pantheon of like Lord of the Rings games mm -hmm. it, it's it's there now and i was like that's really cool to think about and uh so i'm really happy and every time i hear people enjoying that really proud of the work that that everybody involved in on that game yeah when I, we were think, uh, when we were doing the uh the introduction somebody chimed in in the comments there they're like and special guest host of cardboard of the rings <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Yeah, that's fun. Those guys are so they're so awesome. Mm -hmm. All those guys, uh, both from the you know the the first age cast and the second age cast, they're all just they're just the best. Yeah, nice. I think a big thing too, like that game also really helped was to show like how successful you could be with the co op in the LCG setting, and like how yeah. fun you could turn those style of games into. It didn't have to always be the competitive LCGs, which were kind of like what they initially like launched with. <laughs> Um, and I think that's another reason why, like, stuff like Lord of the Rings and the Champions and, of course, the other games, you know, like Arkham, has really helped to show that that's, like, a really fun area that people really get into and enjoy. Yeah, Nate French deserves a lot of credit for uh, for coming up with that idea. Uh, it was fun to hear him tell the story of how it came to be, you know, that he was really into Game of Thrones when he started at the company, and that was the one of the first games he worked on, and... You know, in that community and every other competitive game community, it's really common to simulate the first several turns uh, of the game as you're testing out your deck, right? And he called it gold fishing. Apparently, that's a term I had not heard. That <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just yes. this idea of just like, you know, just playing through your deck and simulating a game. And then he kind of had this aha moment of like, what if that was the game? What if the game was, you know, you just play through on your own? And I think through conversation with Christian, you know, they decided to make it co-op and not just solo and eventually they got the lord of the rings license and so it became the lord of the rings game uh but as far as i know that you kind of invented that genre you know and that's that's a huge achievement because now uh we, yeah we found that the most successful you know stable long-running lcgs are co-op lcgs uh it's it's uh, incredible like if anyone can you know when the the history of ffg you know first edition novel comes out uh, it, it's it's going to it's going to tell some crazy stories of a little design house, you know, in the heart of uh, Minnesota, that pulled some big IPs for, you know, and they were ahead of it, right? Locking down yeah. Lord of the Rings, grabbing, you know, Game of Thrones, taking risks. Man, it's it's like hearing Kristen tell that story too was pretty cool about Game of Thrones because. They used to send out a copy of the book, the first one, uh, with uh, with their game because people didn't know what the book was yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I remember from my interview, um, they hadn't announced that they had the Star Wars license yet, right? So I huge. I show up for my interview, and part of my interview process was to sit down and play a, a prototype Star Wars LCG with uh, with Lucas and Nate. And uh, I remember thinking, geez, you guys, what, you got Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones and Star Wars, like, you know, like, what don't you have? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow. it's, it, it seems like it's just been one, one heck of a roller coaster over there, right? So, from that perspective, you know, tell us the fight that had to go on behind the scenes 
uh, the whole push pull when somebody said in a meeting, so we've got the license for Marvel and we need somebody to, to get on this and, you know, take the reins here. Who's, who can we get to, to... <laughs> yeah, I lobbied hard. I lobbied <laughs> real hard. I can't even be shy about it because everyone at the office knows like, uh, yeah, I've been working on Lord of the Rings for so long at that time. And I wasn't slowing down on it. I was real happy being on that game, but you know, like it's not gonna last forever. You know, you know that game. Every every game has its it has its beginning and its end. Um, deep. So, what's that? That's a, that, was, that was deep right there. Deep. <laughs> well, anyway, I just thought you know what's there. Okay, so to, to go back a step further, um, like I said, I had been on Lord of the Rings my entire tenure at at FFG, and uh, after working on the game for you know seven eight years, I start to ask myself like what will I even do at the company, <laughs> you know, when, when they don't have a Lord of the Rings game for me to, to just like, like, are they just going to like, you know, wave goodbye? Like, thanks for all the time, Caleb, you know, or, you know, what would I even want to work on? You know, like, uh, Keyforge is great. You know, Arkham is great, but those aren't really IPs that capture me personally. Now that that's a luxury that I've been afforded because, you know, when you're a professional game designer, you don't necessarily get to work on just the IPs that you love. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it, it at the end of the day, it's a job, right? You got to you got to work with your best effort on on whatever it is that they ask you to do. Um so when the idea of Marvel came up though, you better believe that I saw a path forward to like working on something else that I really love <laughs> for a good number of years and and uh and it also made sense to me and I and unfortunately it made sense to others too that if we're going to do a, a Marvel co-op LCG, then let's take someone with a lot of co-op LCG experience plus that knowledge and passion about the IP. So I, I think in a lot of ways I was a very natural fit, and I don't remember, I don't remember there being any like resistance to the idea. Yeah, you know, it was it was more just like, well, you're going to be part of a team right now. You know, like you've been a one man show on on Lord of the Rings for a while now. After you know, it was me and, and Matt for a long time, and then Matt stepped away to work on Arkham, and the game kind of just, we just kind of slowed the release schedule down a little bit, so it was possible for one person to do it. Uh, so I'd been kind of a one-man show for a long time, and they're like, well, yeah, we'd like you to be on Marvel, but you, you're going to be part of a team again. <laughs> you know, I'm like, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it really, really shows. Um, honestly, the Previously, we've talked about how the theme is just so there. I mean, we can get into that in a little bit when we talk about some of the character designs and stuff like that. But how you're taking these characters that, you know, if you were to give this to, say, like the average person on the street and they're like, well, name name some Marvel villains and characters. It's not going to be the list that you guys have come up with. Right. Like, <laughs> you, you know, like. There, it, there's some there's some top cuts and there's some deep cuts in the in, in the canon that you have you, you know you have scratched but uh you you definitely waited in the shadows and pounced at the right time on the right ip i, I gotta say that so you know kudos for what you've done so far with it thank you not, i'm gonna challenge that i feel like there's always gonna be someone who's gonna say squirrel girl and always <laughs> someone who says moon knight <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, they're in they're in every group every time well, I, honestly, I hope to get to all of them in time, nice. right? That's the hardest thing is asking passionate fans to be patient, <laughs> you know? Well, especially yeah. when there's just so much out there, right? Like, oh, absolutely. So and that's, that's what makes Marvel so exciting is, you know, you can, you can just see years and years down the road. And, of course, <laughs> you know, the person who's waiting on Squirrel Girl or Moon Knight is not excited about the idea of waiting years and nice. years down the road. Uh, yeah. But it's got to be somebody. So, you know, ultimately, we can't do everybody's favorite hero all at the, uh, at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. All right. Well, I've got a couple, like, little, like, other quick questions, and we're going to get into some of the design stuff. Sure. Um, but I always tend to like ask people kind of like, what is your, since you've been doing this for a while, do you have kind of like a design philosophy you tend to follow whenever you're, you know, you're crafting characters or working on a new game? Um, and if so, what is that philosophy you, you like to use? Sure. Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes I get a little jealous of, of like Nate because he's really good at answering these questions in a way that you're like, I want to take a class with you. You could be my professor 
and I will take notes because he'll put it like in in a way that seems like so so well thought out and like I definitely have you know a, a method and and a, and a and a way of what to do but I don't think I'm as good at like putting it to words so um, I'm gonna stumble through this a little bit and you just bear with hey. me. Hey, um, do we, your best. We've been stumbling so through stuff for like seven <laughs> <Yeah>. years. <laughs> for me, it, 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 everything I've worked on so far is based on an IP, right? You know, either Lord of the Rings or or now Marvel. And so kind of my guiding principle for starters is uh, if you have a game based on a beloved IP, then whatever you're doing with that uh, game needs to feel like that IP. And it needs to really evoke the same feelings and and emotions you know that that uh, the comic books do or that the books you know like the characters need to feel like the characters that that the fans know and love um that's that's a huge thing for me so i've i've played a lot of games in the past that were based on on ips that i knew and uh some of them did a great job of capturing that and others really frustrated me where i was like this this just doesn't even feel like you know like like this thing like whether like there's Lord of the Rings games I've played where I'm like, this is just a game with the Lord of the Rings skin, you know. Like you could you could take the Lord of the Rings skin off and put any other IP on this and it would be the same game. And that's that to me is a missed opportunity. So, and and fortunately I'm not alone in this. This isn't like I'm not like a rebel on the team with this idea. Like pretty much everyone agrees. Like yes, we whatever we're working on, we want to evoke you know uh that ip and so that was that really went into the the dna of the game um so that's where it starts for me it starts with uh you know uh, the experience that i want the player to have is is that a pos- is that a positive or negative like is that is that a challenge that that you're like i i embrace that challenge to try and take that ip and make it um so close and dripping in the theme that i want to play or is it like the difficulty level is now like oh man like i could be in some game that i'm making up the lore i'm making the rules i'm making the characters and i can just pull whatever i want and do Mm. this like these people don't know it like is it harder to to be faithful to something like it's like you know if you take one of your designs say for example like thor right like is it hard to to play within the boundaries of you know of those challenges to so someone can play thor and be like this 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 is what i thought thor as a card game deck would be like i think for me personally it's it's not uh i i think there are designers who feel restricted by that there, there's there's some really creative designers who who just want to like kind of do their own thing and sometimes maybe chafe a little bit at, at being restricted by an IP. I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, FYI, so I don't want you to ask me, like, oh, it's definitely that guy, isn't it? Like, no, I'm, I'm speaking in generalities. I, I imagine there are people who, who would rather just build their own thing and have total freedom. Yeah, but for yeah, me yeah. personally, because I love Lord of the Rings and I love Marvel, um, to me, it's it plays to my strengths. Mm-hmm. Like... I talk about how I work with a crew of really talented people, and that's true. And, uh, you know, so I look at the things that they're really good at, and I kind of sometimes reflect and go, what am I good at? You know, <laughs> And I think one of the things that I consistently get good feedback on is is theme. People talk about, like, oh, I love the way you did this character because it, it just reminded me exactly how that character is in the books. Like, when I play that character, I feel like like I'm, you know, just stepped off the pages. And I love hearing that. You know that that really makes me feel good. So I think that's one of my strengths. So it, it's not a it's not so much a challenge as that is like a, it's just a fun exercise. It's an opportunity. Huh. Sweet. Um, and then another thing, so as you mentioned, you, you know, you used to take like notes and stuff on games and like create like your own game stuff. Was there what were kind of like some impactful games for you as like a budding designer, or maybe like the game you played for the first time, or you were like. Oh, this is it. This is something that's really cool. Um, well, my first, yeah, my first card game, my first collectible card game was Middle Earth: The Wizards. Holy uh, crap! Okay, <laughs> <laughs> like I, uh, I, I mean, I've been a Tolkien fan since the third grade. You know, like I, I, to this day, I just, I'm amazed how I just picked up The Hobbit uh, from the school library at random. Like I just saw a dragon on the cover, and I thought that looks cool. And I read it, and I, I read it again and again, and then I found out there were more, you know. So 
I had actually just finished reading The Lord of the Rings for the first or second time when the game came out. And I was honestly thrilled because now there were pictures of all these people who previously just lived in my head. You know, like, I remember opening up a pack and, and getting the Elrond card and just being excited, like, oh, that's what Elrond looks like, you know? like. And uh, I love the travel mechanic in that game. So if you're not familiar with it, there are location cards. And it was a separate, like, location deck. And the goal was to just travel Middle-Earth from location to location, gathering allies and artifacts and things like that to strengthen your fellowship and score points, ultimately. And uh, so for me, it was like uh, a doorway into Middle-Earth where I had read the books and now I could actually explore the land and encounter people and places that I recognized. And I, I was thrilled. I mean, I was just instantly hooked. Um, and I always played it wrong. I learned that really to this day. I'm really bad at learning new games on my own, and I'm even worse at teaching them to people. <laughs> that that was my buddy Tony Fancy though. just makes fun of me for it all the time. Yeah, like I love. Uh, I'll invite him over and be like, "Hey, I got this new game. You want to come play?" He'll be like, "Sure." And when he comes over, I'm like, "All right, bud. Here's the rules. You tell me how to play." <laughs> I need friends like that, man. <laughs> oh, he's so good at it too. Like he's got a gift for teaching yeah, people games. Yeah. Uh, but that one, yeah, that one really opened my eyes to like what a game could be. I think prior to that, probably the most uh, interesting and thematic game I'd played was Risk. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> not really super deep or or super exciting. Um, it's amazing to me to think of all these games that I used to play and how much my imagination just filled everything in to make it interesting. And that's what I love about these games is like, I'm still using my imagination, but there's a lot more there to work with now. Mm-hmm. Oh, exactly. Like, like you know, being the same boat, right? Like, we're, we're from the days where your risk army was one size cubes, right? And maybe mm-hmm. uh, maybe some, some triangles or something to, to represent different unit. But then, you know, now you, you look at what kids have. Like, if risk came out now, it would be on... Uh, Kickstarter with a billion minis and each right. individually crafted uh, thing, custom dice sets, you know? Yeah. Didn't it? Wild. Nobody has that imagination level anymore. <laughs> but games like that can't sell. You can't push cubes no more. <laughs> yeah, I used to, used to love Battleship as a kid because I would just imagine, you know, the fleet on the water and, you know, the cannons blazing. And, I, you know, you look at it now and like, Oh my gosh, it's just sad to look at. <laughs> uh, all right, well, I guess we'll we'll move into some some meat. So, I know uh, over the weekend you guys had a lot of like crazy announcements and a lot of content coming down the pipe and stuff from for champions. Um, for those of you who haven't watched, like those videos, I believe are on the FFG YouTube. If you want to go through. And like recap those, I think they're also vods on the Twitch channel. Mm-hmm. No, I don't. So I'm assuming, um, but I think we're going to focus a lot on kind of like, uh, your designs and stuff through cycle one. Um, and then a few of the things that you had a really strong hand in, um, with the rise and the once and future Kang packs. So Jameson, why don't you start off kind of with the, with the heroes and stuff through cycle one? Yeah. So if, you know, if we look at some of the work you did, um, outside of the core set because like you said we're we're kind of a little bit stroll down memory lane here now this is probably like whenever you started working on cycle one years ago sure um (laughs) years maybe a year and a half it's time has lost its meaning in 20 it's it's gone it's gone right (laughs) so true (laughs) it's hard to remember (laughs) Uh, so when you when you start and you're you're sitting down to pick your heroes that that you want um is it strange coming into a game like this where where you look at Lord of the Rings and you look at the lifespan of that game? Do you sit down now at the start of this game and just think, oh my god, something that I do now, I'm going to have to worry about nine years down the road? <laughs> it's just, just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> we have those talks. I mean, it's it's life is all about balance, right? So you have to be able to... To try to future-proof, but also don't paralyze yourself trying to imagine every possible combination. There, there has to be a little bit of zen where you just accept that something's going to slip through. At some point, you're probably going to have to errata a card 
you know, because, uh, you, you know, a co- an unforeseen combo came up that just kind of frustrates people or trivializes some element of the game. Um, you know, but you, you want that to be as, as few and far between as possible. So it's it's doing our due diligence, but also leaving ourselves room to experiment and try things, do you, you know. Do you feel um, that it's just as important to have that sense of balance in a cooperative kind of LCG like this compared to like that whole competitive LCG side? Well, that's that's kind of a tricky question because I, I actually haven't worked on a competitive game. <laughs> I've played a lot of them. You know, I've, I've played them even at the world championship level. So I, I certainly appreciate balance in a competitive card game. You know, it's important that, uh, you know, if if one deck emerges as being better than everything else, then that's generally people agree that's not good for a card game. You know, you want a lot of variety. You want a lot of uh, alternate paths to victory. Um, and I think the same holds true for a cooperative game. You don't want to feel like, uh, you know, like, well, this is the one deck that you should play when you play Marvel. If you want to win, just play this. And you especially don't want, as a, as a customer, to feel like the designers are expecting you to play that deck. And so we're building all the scenarios to, you know, um, be at this level that you have to play that deck to compete. You know, that was... That was criticism that was sometimes brought up uh, about Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, by its very nature, is much more challenging uh, than Marvel. It's it's trying to evoke a different feeling. Marvel's all about making you feel strong, and you're the hero, and you're going to win, and you're going to beat the villain. And Lord of the Rings is very much you know inspired by the books, where it's like, how are we ever going to do this? Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> the end game is, is victory already impossible. even possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. So what's this so depending balance? Depending on who was playing, they they might be frustrated with that, and and some people would get, you know, uh, convinced that oh well they're just expecting everyone's playing these real power decks, and uh, so I I think to answer your original question like how important is balance in a in a co op game, I don't know I can't say definitively if it's as important as a competitive game, but it's definitely yeah. important. So what does balance mean for you in Marvel? Uh, I think it. I think it just means that uh, you know there isn't one player strategy, or even two or three player strategies that just feel clearly better than all the rest, right? Like, I think it's okay if some people feel like this hero is just generally stronger than this other hero. Like, you know, sometimes you're gonna find that the numbers support that, and it's true, and and, and that some heroes are just are are better, or at least are better against some villains. And other times it's just going to be subjective to play styles. You know, this hero just fits my play style better, therefore I think it's better than all the others. But as long as people feel like I can pick from a number of heroes, like a good healthy number, the, if the vast majority of the heroes in the game feel like I could play this one and make a deck that's fun and engaging and, and, and still able to win with it, I think we're good. Hmm. Nice. The... Um the heroes that uh, that we have um, here to talk about in the in the cycle one. So you did uh, work on Captain America and you did work on Thor, right? Yeah. Um, how tricky was it to take two of those heroes that kind of use the same, like not the same mechanic, but how, like how hard was it to build two separate builds that still revolve around you know Captain America has a shield. Thor has his hammer and you know one can start with it one has to go and fetch it right like was that was it really tricky to to kind of start off in that space building around that whole item I I, I don't think so um, like Nate said something that really uh, that really stuck with me uh, and that is you you could take any one of these heroes and design them a hundred different ways you know, like the version of Captain America we have is far from the only version of Captain America we could have designed, right? We could have gone so many different ways. I think every one of those versions is going to feature his shield prominently, but what we do with it could have been different. Um, same with Thor and his hammer. So in that sense, no, it's it's not hard out of all those possibilities to come up with two heroes that, that work differently from each other, even if they share some similarities like Cap's kind of all about his shield. Thor's kind of all about his hammer. Um, 
even then, though, like, you know, the, the shield is more typically a, a defensive thing, and the hammer is more typically offensive, so that, that informed part of our design. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, and I guess to throw in there, I mean, kind of in a sense, because everyone, all those heroes kind of have, like, their unique thing, and even, like, Strange in his own way, instead of it being, like, an item, he's, like, recalling the draw, he has a spell deck. So he also has like his own little gimmick and his own little thing that he also plays with that makes them all stand like really unique. So, you know, I realized it just there where we had that nice long awkward pause. Like there was more to my thought <laughs> that I failed to to articulate. Yeah. And then we all laughed, and I was like, "Oh, that's why." Okay, so you asked if it was hard, and I would say that in in practice, no, it's not hard. The hard part for me is that I've learned about myself is that uh, it's very easy for me to to fall into a pattern. Um, I think Matt might have been one of the first people to point this out to me, uh, having worked with me on Lord of the Rings so much. Um, it's just something, I think uh, I'm a creature of habit. I love to go to the same places for lunch. You know, it, it makes it easy <laughs> for me to plan out my day. Like, it's not, it's not meticulous, right? It's not like Monday I go here, or Tuesday. But I bet if you looked at my week after week, you would find that it's almost like I schedule it, even though I don't. Um, and so I think it, it, it seeps into my design where you kind of find like, hey, this works. And you start to do it without thinking about it. So like Cap and Thor are actually the, the two most egregious in this area. And I don't know that this is bad necessarily, but, you know, Cap has the superhuman strength upgrade that generates physical resources, mm. right? That's part of his kit. And then Thor has the God of Thunder upgrade that generates, you know, energy resources. And they're essentially the same design, right? They just provide different resources. And that right there, when I when I realized I'd done that, I was like, oh, okay, wake up a little bit here, Caleb. You're going to have to make sure that you don't just start throwing, like, <laughs> two of a resource generator into everyone's kit. You know, you got to make sure that you're really trying uh, to, to make sure that you're, you know, not getting locked into something. So it's it's interesting because I'm always like, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know, kind of in, in life, in practice. But in game design, that, that can be a trap, mm. right? Was it strange to hear some of the – I mean, I don't know how much you get caught up in, in the community kind of feedback. But, you know, when um, – when we looked at early versions of Thor and everyone, you know, you have the comments about, oh, he's so overpowered or, you know, and then behind the scenes, you guys are like, oh, man, we're, you know, we're trying to do something different and we're trying to make him more difficult because in playtesting, he's, you know, we're just killing it, right? Like, is it, is it weird to hear a little bit of that feedback when you come or when someone or do you just kind of equate it to, you know, cult of the new kind of thing? Like, yeah, everyone's going to jump on the new I'm releasing. just trying to figure out if you if you accidentally said overpowered when you meant to say <laughs> underpowered. <laughs> the criticism yeah. that I have heard most yeah. frequently with Thor is that he doesn't feel strong enough to be <laughs> Thor. When when in reality the the playtesting thing we struggled with is that he felt too strong, uh, which which then frustrates the people who who are like, how could he be too strong? I'm I can't beat Rhino with them and. Um, well, maybe it's just because so, I've played a lot of Thor. So, uh, from my perspective of it, I thought that you know I, I got to the point where I was very comfortable and maybe like you, you know, like you in the sense creature of habit is once I found, once I play a game with a certain strategy, it's hard for me to think outside the box. It's just becoming natural. Like I'm like, oh yeah, get sure. my get my hand up and boom, 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 right? Like so. Uh, so yeah. Thor for you is really strong. He is. I, I think he's. Yeah. I think he's. He's. Uh, you know, if you can get things going. But again, I think that it's the magic of this game that everything is going to come down to play style, right? Because I didn't mm -hmm. understand when people are telling me that that he's so weak. I found him very strong uh, to play. I, I was. I could come in there and I can crush with Thor. All right. And so, to me, sure. I was just like. You know your thoughts on on hearing that kind of stuff behind the scenes. You know, do you do you worry about the you know underpower, overpower kind of stuff, or are you just building fun fun guys? Well, that's I, I would say one of the advantages of working on a co op game is that you don't have to worry too much about underpower, overpower. There's certainly don't get me wrong; those are conversations we have all the time. And and uh, out of everyone in the office, I think most often I am the one saying, "Wow, this feels too good." 
you know, should we should we dial it back a little bit? And uh, oftentimes I really appreciate, you know, whether it's Matt or, or Boggs or someone else saying, no, no, Caleb, it's okay to swing for the fences sometimes. Sometimes it's okay to have these really big explosive effects. Like that's that's good for the game. It's it's exciting. It creates a memorable moment. Because, um, it, yeah, it, it's interesting when you get to meet people like, some people are really ambitious designers, and some people, are a little, like myself, I'm a little bit more of a conservative designer. Just to, that, like, I'm, I feel like I'm always looking at the long view. You know, I'm thinking about kind of back to your earlier question about how's this going to impact the game several cycles down the road, where some of my coworkers uh, are a little more focused on, hey, what's going to sell this cycle? What's going to get people excited about this cycle? Let's not presume that we have several cycles down the road let's make sure that this cycle is is good and so i think there's a good balance there where uh like i think matt and i made a really good team in that regard and i think box and i make a good team in that regard too so um yeah i think it's it's nice that we have uh this discussion about power level but ultimately um we we have a, a nice uh i think cushion on either side you know um, so as far as like, what do I think though, when people make these comments, like, um, I guess, first of all, I'm just excited that they're passionate enough to be talking about it. Yeah. You know, like I, I really try yeah. not to take that for granted that, you know, I'm quoting Nate a lot tonight, but I, I don't mind that because Nate's been the most influential person, like on my career at FFG. And he taught me some things like real early on, you know, like real early on about, not just um, how to design games, but also being a game designer. And one of the things that he talked about right away was like, you got to develop some thick skin. Mm. You know, people people are always going to have opinions. You know, like nerds have strong opinions. You know, and, and I say that as a nerd. You know, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm, I'm wearing my nerd hat. I totally am in the club. I have strong opinions. Um, and so, he, yeah, he just kind of pointed out like, you got to, you, you can't look past the fact that, that they're so excited about this this game that they're going online and commenting yeah. or that they're taking time to email you. And uh, so that's always the number one thing that I want to express to people is like, I'm, I'm not offended by your strong opinions, you know, like the, I'm, I'm glad you have those strong opinions. I don't necessarily agree with all the strong opinions, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, like uh, the only thing that ever upsets me is when people are just rude. You know, and that's not just yeah. limited to to game design uh, forums. That's just in life, right? Yeah, like, yeah. No, no I, one likes a jerk. I right? try to be nice to each other. Say what you want to say, but you know, say it in a constructive way. I get, exactly. I was just gonna use that exact word, right? Like, I mean, you, as soon as we put our opinions into video form that will live on forever, you can look at old Netrunner videos where we would get ripped in comments for for things we say. But I'm like, bring constructive criticism. Let's have a discussion, right? Like, mm -hmm. like talk to me about it. Um, but you know what, though, it's, it's interesting that, you know, some of the stuff that you said there, because I feel like that's what plays into the, I, I don't want to use this term for, like, I use it loosely, but the family friendliness of this game, where I could sit down with somebody that really doesn't really know anything about card games that maybe, or, or games, and they think that the, the objective is to win, right? My objective playing this game is to just have a good experience. I, yes. I don't care. I don't care if the game beats me, right? I, I don't care if the game is going to push back. I don't need to win to tell you that you've made a good game, right? Like, or that this was a good game. I could sit here. I've had some. I've had some long ass games of of Marvel. Like when we're playing on the difficulties levels, where we've got modules in there that probably should not be even included in, in a set, right? But we're just like you know, playing for a good chunk of time and just get creamed at the end because it comes down to one card or, or we lost by one hit and there was you know, the threat pushed over by, by one level and we're just like, wow, that was epic. But, you know, see you next week. So I, I think that it, it does a good job where you, it's okay to have an overpowered hero because maybe somebody needs that. Somebody, somebody for them is the experience is the win. Maybe the underpowered heroes, the underdogs, Pulling out a victory with those is, you know, rewarding for people like, you know, me or finding out how being a deck building game, right? Like, how can I make this person that nobody plays be that top tier deck? What's the what's the code? What was what were those guys thinking? You know, sure. Um, 
one of them uh, things I'd like to touch on quickly about that uh, is uh, in Doctor Strange. And, you know, we talked about longevity of, of a mechanic or something. How difficult was it in there to talk or to add in the whole switching of status? You know, uh, the, the oh, his um, Winds of Watum, or is it Vapors of Valtor? I forget what it's called. That that switches changes one status to another. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Like I remember, we've had a lot of offline discussions, or when everything comes up in some of these newer sets, you know, where, uh, um, like Ronan says, like he can't. What is it like? He can't be stunned, or something like that. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's like now, like what do we open up when you can just you know when you come in and can Doctor Strange all these status cards around now that now that he's out there, right? Like, oh, it, sure, sure, sure. It, is, so is this, it, is this it, something it, that you're gonna always be burdened with, like down the road? Now, <laughs> like you've you've kind of put yourself into a design space where now Doctor Strange is gonna be like, you know, the the, the measuring stick. <laughs> that it's all- that particular example, at least, isn't in my mind really. Uh, complicating anything you know if someone cannot be stunned that's absolute they can't be stunned you know so um i haven't been asked that particular question of like what happens if ronan has a tough status card and i try to change it into a stun um i that's the kind of question i would actually say all right box yeah how do you feel about this and make sure we're on the same page <laughs> yeah no yeah. we don't want any rules because uh, I, 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 I can see it being like well you transform it to a stun and it just falls off because you can't be stunned or you just can't turn it to a stunned and and you could turn it to a confuse or something like that uh in either case he's not getting stunned <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> so you, you, like you guys weren't worried about that playing like into the, the longevity because we thought that was like a pretty powerful mechanic being able to move those around and do that kind of manipulation yeah. or was so, it just like something you're like you know what's going to be really fun this i think it was more of that so really <laughs> uh i want to give props to uh jeremy's warren you brought him up earlier and that was actually that card in particular was a suggestion of his um because he was helping us play test dr strange and um uh, he didn't have that spell in his kit at first. You know, he had, he had some of the others that you're already familiar with, and there was probably something different there. And uh, and I remember, you know, kind of one of his comments, a little bit of criticism was that, you know, they didn't all feel magical enough. That they, they didn't, you know, they were relatively straightforward. There were spells, oh, but at the end of the day, it was like it's doing damage or removing threat. You know, he's like, I'd really like to see something more magical, something that feels like only Doctor Strange can do this. And I, and I just thought that, you know, that's a really fair point. Um, so he suggested this idea of, like, what if he could transform, you know, this kind of status into that kind of status. I was like, that's super dope. Let's do that. Um, so we definitely tested it after We've got the power to do that. <laughs> everybody liked it. Yeah. So I it's, just thought, cool, that just, you know, made the design that much better. Right. And it makes them really stand out. And that's what I really dig about it is it adds that uniqueness is like, that's like one of the things that's like only Dr. Strange can do right now in the game. And that's like a really cool effect he has. So I'm glad I, it seems to have resonated. How, yeah. how did that mechanic come about? Like that strange would use like a set of spells know, spell, like a, a separate deck like that. Yeah. It went, it went through a process. So like, you know, um, there's there's our process and then there was like the specific specifics of dr strange's process and so like our process in general is you start with a vision and you say this is the character we're going to do and this is what this character's powers are and this is how we're going to try to represent them in the game and this is how they're going to you know have a unique role in the game as a result and then comes the actual development where you say okay let's try to capture these big ideas and put them on actual cards and uh, sometimes, you know, it works right away. And other times you go, okay, well, that, that kind of fell flat a little bit or that felt a little more complicated than it needed to be. Um, you know, how do we refine it? And so he went through some edits. I, I don't remember how many, but we eventually settled on, like, what if he just had a separate deck over here that are his spells? Uh, because for me in particular, one of the things that makes Doctor Strange really interesting is how he's different from like Iron Man or Cap or Thor and like you can take Cap's shield away, you can take Iron Man's armor away, but you can't take Doctor Strange's magic away. Not unless you're like a more powerful sorcerer and somehow Ooh. cut him off from the source, you know. 
But otherwise, it's like, you know, maybe you take his Cloak of Levitation or his Eye of Agamotto away, but he still has the spells that he knows. They're still in his library. Um, so that's what I liked about that. It was sort of like he's always going to have access to one of these. Hmm. and uh that's that's really powerful right that's like someone pointed out that's like an extra card in his hand all the time uh so you know we talked about how how can we balance that we're like well first of all it's more interesting if they're all unique if each one is like for fans of dr strange you know it's going to be something iconic like for me the crimson bands of cytorak was something like even as a like, I'm not a diehard Doctor Strange fan, but more like I'm familiar with them. And, like, even I know Crimson Bands of Satorak. Like, I wanted to see that. <laughs> and actually, someone pointed out to me, this is really cool. Like, that's in the movies. I was so, I was like, how did I not even pay attention to that? <laughs> but, like, that's an Infinity War. Like, he uses the Crimson Bands of Satorak to grab Thanos. It's there with, like, the red tendrils yeah. come up. And, Blind like, see, up, I'm like, yeah. that's so cool. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we wanted to do some of these, like, really iconic, and, you know, we have limited card space, obviously, in a pack, so, like, five <laughs> seemed like a healthy number, you know, uh, to rotate through. You're going to get some variety. So, one of the, you know, then you have, this is a really powerful ability, but it's balanced by the fact that they're randomized. You don't get to choose the order they come up. So, you might really want to play Winds of a Tomb, but it might not be there when you want it. Uh, and you have to exhaust your hero to do it. So that means for that action, you're not using his thwart or attack. You know, you're exhausting him to, to cast this spell instead. So that was, you know, some of the, the thought that went into that. It's, it seemed appropriate that he would have to exhaust and concentrate a little bit, you know, to, to conjure this magic. D does your design space start with a hero that you want to put in? Or do you have like a mechanic and you kind of go through the Rolodex to see who will match best with that? Um, I think there's room in the future that we could do that, but mostly it starts with who are the heroes we want to do. Mm. Like, so let's start with the heroes and then we'll figure out. Well, I will say, though, that, you know, as we're narrowing down that list, because obviously Marvel has a lot of heroes to choose from, it's unlikely that we're going to choose two heroes with similar power sets in the same cycle, just because it's, it's going to be harder for them to stand apart. You know, like, we wouldn't want to do um, two Hulks in the same set. Right, mm -hmm. you know, like we actually did them not too far apart, yeah. but far enough, right? Yeah, because um, yeah, you want to make sure that uh, the 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 character, their power set is going to inform your design. So if their if their identity in the comics is a bruiser, then uh, you don't want to do too many bruisers. Otherwise, after a while, it's like, wow, how many different ways are you going to have? <laughs> Can you punch someone who's really strong? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh, that's cool, and. Um, is there like a mechanic that you've built into some of these characters that is your favorite so far? Um, like for example, my favorite like uh, standout mechanic that you guys have done is when it, you've sprinkled in that little bit of randomness. Uh, I mean, it's in the Doctor Strange one since we're on Doctor Strange, where you know uh, it does something and then you have to discard a card and then whatever symbol is on that something can happen right it's like yeah. you know, even with the hulk ally you know it's like good yeah, yeah. good 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 bad you know so <laughs> it's, it's like that little bit of randomness that you're you're always on the verge and someone's like i think i might activate my oh, like don't activate your hulk right now man don't do it <laughs> right or uh you know stuff like that like i i just like that you guys have sprinkled in that little bit of of, of random play where you can control if you want if, if you if it's coming but um, you know whether you want to do it or need to do it are two different questions. But I don't know if you have like a, a standout hero or or a, or a mechanic that you've kind of done here. I, I yeah, it's kind of hard. It's like asking me to pick my favorite child, which I, I wouldn't. I would never do. Right? <laughs> I love them all. Um, that said, my favorite child is Cap. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, as far as, like, one that I'm... If there's one standout one for me, I'm not sure. Like, there's so many that uh, I'm, I'm really proud of. Like, um, not always just mine either. Like, just as a team, I think we've put some really fun stuff out there. Like, uh, Cap is actually one of my favorites just for its simplicity. Like, uh, um, he kind of a throwback to my, my love for Lord of the Rings. Like, when I opened up that core set and I got Aragorn... And Aragorn's ability was, you know, you come into the quest and you spend a resource to ready him back up. And uh, I just love that action advantage. I always love action advantage in, in card games. And uh, it really just set him apart. Like other heroes, they commit to the quest and they're exhausted. But Aragorn, 
he gets back up and he'll keep fighting. And, you know, that's what Cap does too. You know, I love the, I can do this all day, you know, kind of quote. Yeah. And, uh, but Cap's real honest, you know, like he, he won't accept a free meal. He's going to pay you for that meal. It felt like he, he's going to have to discard a card from hand. He's going to have to pay for this every time he does it. There's no, there's no cheating with Cap, you know? Um, now we've seen Quicksilver. He'll take the shortcut. He'll just ready back up. He'll use his power just ready. You know, Cap's wagging his finger at him like, "Hey, slow down there, Speedster." Like you, you know, don't forget to tip. You know. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I like the simplicity of that. I like uh, I like Nick Fury for the uh, the other Lord of the Rings throwback to the corset Gandalf who would enter play and do all this stuff. That was a fun conversation. I think that's it's really for me. It's more about the memory of designing Nick Fury than the actual impact on the game i think he's a good card in the game but i remember we had reached a point uh me and nate and boggs where the core set was more or less you know uh coming together but we felt like hey there's room for another you know unique neutral character here you know let's let's put nick fury what should he do and i remember saying it you know that for me gandalf was the most exciting card in the in the core set for the way he just shows up and does a thing and then he and then he leaves like that there was just quintessential gandalf and i was like you know i think our corset needs a gandalf let's make that nick fury that's kind of who he is in the comics he shows up helps out and then he's like my yeah, work yeah. here's done yep and, and he leaves so that was that was a lot of fun just just that process i, I like that a lot i'm yeah. glad you like the random stuff in doctor strange that was something too that i felt like magic shouldn't feel as precise as like technology like a repulsor beam, when you exhaust it, it's always going to do, you know, the same amount of damage, right? Just depending on whether or not you're aerial. But magic is a little bit more like, how well did I cast this spell this time? And uh, so I really like the idea that it, it was going to be, it might be a really, really good magic spell, or it might be an okay one, yeah. uh, depending on what you discard. Yeah, I, so I'm, I'm glad that's resonated. I can tell you, you know, weird little side story from this is that uh, the most difficult thing you guys ever did was release Black Panther and Captain Marvel in the core set because my kids are very much at the age where they're oh what'd you do like they go to bed and they know that daddy goes to his game night sometimes they want to know sure. what's going on the next day or they're like you know daddy are you gonna go play Marvel tonight you gonna play but because my son's all about Cap uh, Black Panther and my daughter's just Captain Marvel so they're oh, like great. can you go play Black Panther tonight tell me how you did in the morning and I'm like oh so that's I'm, awesome then I'm like <laughs> I'm like, but, but, but daddy just got the Dr. Strange pack. I don't know what that means, dad, but can you play Black Panther tonight? I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll play Black Panther. Then, you know, oh, are you going to play Captain Marvel? No, I played Captain Marvel last week. Uh, daddy just got the new Hulk pack. You know, he want, really wants to play Hulk tonight. Something new. Some, but, but why, dad? Captain Marvel's the best. Fine, I'll play oh, Captain that's so Marvel. Awesome. Uh, so that's that's kind of the balance, uh, uh, the ping pong match, and the struggles that I have is you guys release my kids' two favorite heroes in 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 the core set. So I mean, now what? Do I'm I so do? glad to hear that. I, I really am. Um, like I actually, uh, you were talking earlier about uh, that this is a game that that appeals to uh, to non gamers. It's family friendly. Like that. That's so rewarding to hear because that was a huge part of our pitch for the game that was that was a driving force behind the vision and the design was that it should be accessible like we kept saying it's it's not a game for kids it's but it's a game you can play with your kids mm. and uh I, I have to say probably one of the most rewarding things that has happened for me maybe in my entire tenure at, at ffg was uh getting a call from one of my high school friends tim and he told me like he and his kids have all been playing marvel champions and uh, after, like, you know, the, the pandemic kind of started uh, to break out and everybody's, you know, working from home and that uh, they were looking for something to do. So he, he was like, do you think we'd get you on a Skype call? You could talk to my kids, you know, they could meet the game's designer. And, like, wow, that was so special. Uh, yeah, it was just, like, really cool to see these kids just really pumped up about playing the game and, and playing with their dad. And, of course, their dad's, like, one of my childhood friends and... It's like that's that's just magic right there. That it, felt so. Good. It's really crazy. Like my my kids could not like they're they're both five and they can't sit there and play the game yet. But they'll look at the card art forever, right? And the be like yep. things. And now you know going through the the Ant Man stuff. I know that we're not going to touch on that, but oh, 
guess who appears on a on a card is miles morales so it's my son's <laughs> like oh when's miles morales going to be in the game and i've already had the question with boggs about when thanos is going to show up because my son keeps asking me about about thanos cards and stuff and he just doesn't uh, yeah he can't wrap his head around the fact that he just he's like well where is thanos i'm like well they haven't made him yet well what do you mean they haven't made him yet he's there he's there, like <laughs> i see him in the movie right like and i'm like relax relax you know, your son sounds like he should be in one of like our boardroom meetings. Like, <laughs> seriously, guys, where is Thanos? Why isn't he out yet? And wh- where's Miles Morales? What are you guys even doing what, here? What Let's is happening? What is bunch put of, a fire under it? Bunch of slackers. <laughs> uh, let's get Corey's got some great questions to talk about. The um, one of the the best things I think that you you guys have brought to this game. Um, uh, and I'll let Corey kind of talk about the diversity of the scenarios that that have come. Yeah, so um, we we chat a lot in like some of our earlier videos about like we want like a lot of new scenario content, and of course with the last announcements and everything, of course rise rise of the red the rise of red skull. I put the V in the wrong spot all the time. Um, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of new scenarios coming, which is awesome. We're super excited. Um, and a big thing between like the Wrecking Crew and then the announcement of the Once and Future Kang, um, just seems amazing and is like very creative and like out of the box thinking. Because like normally you get the course that most of those here, most of those villains are kind of like you know team fights villain. You know that's it. It's like a little twist here and there, make an extra stage. But then when you had like the Wrecking Crew, it really like spun it around where it was just like team fights team of villains. You know, and like now they're all battling. And then like with the idea behind Once and Future Kang, now it's like team fights villain, then everyone gets thrown all over the place and you're all on your own in different time periods and like areas trying to battle your way back to the villain. Just a wild and crazy like twist. And I guess the big on this is like um one, um, you know, like the idea and the concept, um, to even come up with that like that plan, but and another one is you've definitely taken and made these really cool, interesting scenarios with some kind of obscure villains and me, I've not been like a big Avengers fan, but when I like read, even just like hearing about how the Kang scenario worked, when we did our episode previewing it, I actually went and researched and like read up about Kang. And I was like, this guy is wild. Like this, <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> this all makes sense me to do homework. Yeah. I have research yeah. assignments. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but then I was realized just how like perfect and like how thematic the the scenario was once I read like all those different versions and where it came from and everything and it was just wild but it had me actually go and research and learn about like some of these and he may not be obscure in the Avengers universe but to me he was kind of like an obscure villain and it made me sure. like more interested to go figure this stuff out so cool yeah yeah well mission accomplished. <laughs> trying to get everybody to read comic books. <laughs> That's it. You're just you're trying well, to hipster villain all of us. No, actually, it's it's really funny because because again, um, my son, I don't I don't. He's like a a little walking build. He's building his own Marvel Wiki, Wikipedia in his head, right? And everyone was talking about uh, like the group that I play with. Um, I was talking to my wife at breakfast. I like, oh yeah, we played this Wrecking Crew thing last night. It was the new one. Blah blah. It came out, and then my son's like, oh, the Wrecking Crew. He's like. Uh, you know, is, Th- is Thunderball in that one? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, you know those four guys from that that like look like construction pieces. I'm like, where's this from? He's like, Superhero Squad, Dad, Superhero Squad. That's so awesome. I'm like, what are you talking about? Then he had to show me on like the Disney Plus. He's like, got he watches the superhero Marvel Superhero Squad, and he's like, oh, see, that's so great. See, there they are. I'm like, oh, I guess they're not yeah. as obscure as people think. I'm like, if yeah, my, no, my five year old knows group. about it. <laughs> the Wrecking Crew is like the original uh, villain team, yeah. you know. Like, um, let's. So, I think Marvel's very first crossover event, the original Secret Wars, happened. I think like 1984 or something like that. That was a comic. Another like random thing I picked up at a library and just started reading. I was like, ha- I got dropped in like halfway through the story arc. I had no idea what was going on. Like the heroes were all trapped underneath a mountain. Like that, the bad guys had dropped a mountain on them, and the Hulk sure. was holding it up. And uh, uh, Mister Fantastic is like trying to tick off the Hulk on purpose because he knows that it, the angrier he is, the stronger mm-hmm. he is. And um, and the Wrecking Crew they they featured very heavily 
in that crossover, you know, the, the story was that like all the best heroes and all the best villains got transported to battle world, you know, and they had to <laughs> fight it out. And, uh, yeah, so Wrecking Crew was there with, like, Dr. Octopus and Dr. Doom, and every film that was a doctor got in because they're PhDs in, in being <laughs> evil. Uh, but the Wrecking Crew, yeah. They, so it's kind of funny to hear them described as obscure because, like, they've been around forever. But I guess they've never been, like, A-list. You know, they're not Magneto, right? They're they're not Dr. Doom. Um, but for a Marvel fan like me, it's like, well, of course I know the Wrecking Crew. Yeah, yeah. So. So, so how hard it is for you to pitch those? Like, I imagine when you guys are coming with the ideas of the villains, you know, someone is like, "Yeah, Red Skull. We'll have Red Skull be great. Ultron, yeah, Ultron." And then, like, you come around the corner and you're like, "Wrecking Crew." You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really not a hard sell. Uh, at least it hasn't been yet. Um, one of the great things about doing those uh, villain packs is that we can really like just go crazy with those because there there's nothing else that comes in there except you know the the content for that pack we don't it doesn't have to work with anything else right it just it stands alone and uh yeah Nate especially loved the the pitch Nate actually helped out with the initial design on that one he loved the idea of four villains and, and play at the same time you know and just how different that was that's one of the things that you know I I'm glad to hear you say how much you like the variety in the scenarios because that's one of the things we knew we want to do right away especially with the villain packs, was say, uh, you know, what else can Marvel Champions be? What else can a, a, a villain scenario look like? You know, how can we, how can we communicate to our, our fans immediately that this game is not going to be the same old thing every time you play? You know, that uh, I, I think that's this is another issue of balance where it's like the, the experience needs to be similar enough that you get to play your deck right and that you get to uh attack the villain and thwart the schemes and use your powers but it needs to be different enough that you know fighting ultron is not the same as fighting green goblin is not the same as fighting claw you know they need to feel distinct from each other uh so wrecking crew for me was just like an obvious choice for uh for a team centric encounter where it's like they're they're the og of, of villain teams um yeah, you never see them apart, it, you know? It, it yeah. was really crazy to see that kind of, like, when I'm reading it or when you guys did the stream and, and kind of released it, you're like, this is how it's going to work. And I was trying to wrap my brain around it, like, oh, my God, this is this is weird. Four villains at time. Is this going to be, holy smokes, how's, how's anyone going to beat this game? I'm like, this is going to be awesome. Um, but I think that, and I'm not just saying this because you're on our show and we want you to come back and develop this relationship and stuff like that. Right. So this is not, this is not the, this is not the butter up sales pitch. But well, that's what the paycheck is for. Yeah. I appreciate that. Oh yeah. Box told you, huh? That's yeah. Yeah. Mean. Make sure to spell my name right. When you make out the check. Cause yeah. I've had issues with other podcasts. I'm talking to you, cardboard of the ring. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember being at like, um, at, at uh, Gen Con and you know some of these uh, other conventions and things like that, where back in the Netrunner days, you know your focus, we're in the grind. It's like we sit there and we you get up at 7 a.m., hit the card table, and it's grind, 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 and you'll go for beers with someone later. How's your day? My day was such a grind. Yours? Oh, I had a great time. I'm over here playing this limited edition Lord of the Rings scenario. <laughs> oh, we had like 15 <laughs> people together. It was mind blowing. We were going in attacking this board, and I'm like. Why can't I just have a good time over there with these guys? I'm worried. <laughs> I can't. I can't go to bed tonight because I need the cut and I'm. I, I gotta study this up thing here and run some other variants and stuff. These guys are like, yeah, we just, you know, we just had the best time of our lives. Fifteen people. I didn't know. I'm playing this Lord of the Rings epic scenario, and I'm like, one day, you know, I'd love to just do that. And now I was like so happy because I mean, w when I knew that you know you were the guy kind of behind all of those. And it was like, okay, now it's Marvel. I'm like, I, I'm into this new game, this this new IP. I love it, blah, blah, blah. I'm really excited to see, you know, that you tap into that creativeness again. That So now I can go to the conventions and make fun of all the people playing the competitive games and tell them over beers and, and drinks that I'm having a great time playing these epic, crazy scenarios, you know, uh, something, whatever you guys have planned teamed up when the world opens its doors again um, yeah I, I was really looking forward to to gen con you know 
six months ago before we knew you know what was coming because kang kang the once in future kang scenario pack that was going to be debuting at gen con and i was really looking forward to seeing people playing that multiplayer you know it's 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 clearly a scenario that's going to shine in multiplayer it's going to be a lot of fun solo we tested it we know it's a lot of replay value because you know the you're getting different villains every time you play but that that um that group setting is fun then to you know say like oh my gosh look who you got you know hey can you hurry up meet that guy so yeah, come over yeah. and help me and uh yeah. yeah it really is a great experience what you're talking about lord of the rings it's it's been such a blessing honestly to to work on that game and go to those conventions and watch people just uh have such a great time getting their butts kicked by the yeah. scenario and i mean i think the first time i experienced <laughs> it is is when cory and i went to, to gen con and uh, we were kind of dabbling with um Arkham Horror, and it was the one, uh, the Labyrinth yeah. one, you know, the big hole you can Yeah, labyrinth the Labyrinth of Lunacy. Yeah, right, was out, and, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna play, uh, play this, and Corey's like, no, you gotta play these. He's like, have you ever told you about these epic Lord of the Rings kind of <laughs> scenarios that happen at Gen Con? He's like, don't miss out on these co-op ones, and after that, I'm like, you, you have to just get in there, so I was really stoked to see that, and uh, I think you've brought those touches on, like what Corey was saying, uh, you know, what's going to happen with Kang and, and the Wrecking Crew. It's not just, I'm not, all of us put a beat down on a villain, right? It's it's something that I, I mean, that's why you're the designer, right? But something that I could never think about. Yeah, I'm definitely a cut above, you know, I'm a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Wow, that's good. No, that's funny. You know, you mentioned you mentioned Matt, and uh, honestly, like a lot of those, uh, he's really good at coming up with those uh, bi big ideas, right? Like, um, you, you mentioned like the fifteen. You know, I, so it was really it was a twelve player right scenario where you could have mm -hmm. three games of four going at the same time that we call it epic multiplayer in Lord of the Rings, and uh, that was actually something like Matt and I, and I think Nate was involved a little bit too, and probably Jeremy's were, and like. We really brainstormed all that. It was a real team effort, you know, to come up with the concept, right? To to come up with this idea of, like, how could we get, you know, this group of players over here and this group of players over here and then bring them together where they're relying on each other. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that's working out. People really responded to that because there, there was some hesitation from uh, from the people in charge of, you know, green lighting that stuff. There was a little bit of reservation on their part of, like, how, how's that going to work or... You know, what are the unforeseen consequences of doing that? And we eventually convinced them to give it a shot. And uh, we got some, well, I guess I can actually, I can I can mention Christian Peterson here because he kind of owned it later. Like he was real hesitant the first time he shot it down. He was like, no, nah, I don't I don't think we want to go there. Um, but we were persistent. The next year we brought it up again and he was like, all right, give it a try. And I guess somebody was just so pumped up about our first uh, epic multiplayer event at Gen Con. That they actually like tracked down Christian like at a bar or I don't know or maybe <laughs> maybe it was no I think it was the uh, the in flight report actually I'm sorry it was the in flight report it was nothing stalkerish about it it was uh, he did a Q and A section uh, at the end right and uh, the last person to get up was like this isn't a question I just want to tell you like I just played the Lord of the Rings thing and it was amazing you know and <laughs> it was actually on video somewhere because I remember I missed it someone told me about it so I had to go watch it. <laughs> And Christian, Christian's response was great. He says, somewhere, Caleb Grace is smiling. Because <laughs> I wasn't convinced. So he, he convinced me to do it. And so, I, I, you know, he's like, I guess he was right. You know, like, that was pretty gracious of him. But, but I feel like that's what we have to look forward to with this game, right? Like, superheroes and comic books are all about those epic team-ups and that, those, you know, big battles against you know, Sinister Six or, you know, those you know, Doctor Doom or, you know, that, that those, yeah, those legendary, <laughs> yeah, there you go, those Let's go real big, <laughs> <laughs> those legendary villains, right, that, that, you know, you just talk about all the time, so I, I'm really excited to see that you guys aren't just cookie cuttering these, uh, these scenarios, right, so, no, that, that's the last thing we want to do, honestly, that, that you know, kind of going back to Way back, or being in the conversation, we're, we were talking about, you know, how we approach games and why theme is so important and, you know, how, you know, games that I've played in the past, they they had me really excited at first and then I kind of lose interest as I realized that they're just, they're kind of doing what you described. There's a little bit of cookie cutter, like, you know, you could really just 
copy paste this design and put a different skin on it and and we definitely don't want to do that you know um we we definitely want to make sure that we continue to innovate and surprise our audience and you know take risks and hopefully they pay off you know uh Corey, is there anything else you wanted to kind of touch on with uh with those two packs before we just kind of i guess cram red skull into the last little bit here because we don't want to kill your whole night yeah no i think already we can just touch on um the rise of red skull <laughs> real quick sure um so yeah i don't want to go too deep um because we're about to hit spoiler season or whatever and uh, sure. i might get some like stuff coming out about you know it's right around the corner but i guess if there's any thing you might want to like call out about it something might have been like one of your favorite parts about it or maybe something that you're real excited for the community to get a hold of and see um with that set yeah, no, I'm mostly I'm just excited, uh, you know, for for Rise of Red Skull and and Kang to drop so that the number of playable scenarios in the game just doubles like overnight, just boom, you know, Abs- absolutely, uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because I I have to say I am I am so just pleased with with how excited people are about the game, um, even though they've only had the few scenarios to play during this time, like. I've never been in that situation where where our customers are right now, where there's you know there's what the three in the core, the two in Green Goblin, and then the Wrecking Crew. So you got like six playable scenarios. Mm-hmm. I- I've never had less than a dozen scenarios to choose from because I've you know I've been developing them always, mm-hmm. and so it's it's easy for the game to stay fresh for me. Like what? I, what do I, you mean? <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, when I was working on Rise of Red Skull. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, Rise of Red Skull is our first campaign box, right? It's it's the icebreaker. It's it's blazing a trail. So, uh, you know, I don't think we went uh, too crazy with, with our designs, right? We're, we're kind of trying to establish uh, the ground floor, so to speak, of, of campaign boxes. So I don't think there's anything in there that's going to, you know, challenge you to really wrap your head around it. But I think it will challenge you in terms of, um, you know, wow, I've never faced a villain like Red Skull before. You yeah. know, where like Crossbones is, uh, he's the first scenario in the box. And I, I, he's more or less the most straightforward uh, of the villains. You know, his whole thing is like, you know, he's a mercenary and a hitman. He, he loves being heavily armed, you know, so he... He's got some weapons in his kit, and his ability is like, while he has weapons, he's just more deadly. So, you know, watch, watch your back if he's carrying something. Um, yeah, that was an interesting mechanic there, too, right? The the weapon attachments. Yeah, I think I think that's fun. Like, he's got a... I, I don't remember if we spoiled it, but he has, like, his machine gun, which comes with a certain number of ammo counters, and that, that number, it, it scales with the number of players. And pretty much every time he attacks you, he's, like, spending that ammo... And milling the encounter deck to do damage equal to the number of boost pips that get yeah. uh, discarded. So he's just just gunning you down. You, you're that, safe. That was it was of... it was spoiled. You're, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're safe. Well, I mean, every now and then I can I can sort of spoil. I <laughs> know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and I think that's an amazing. Like I was first introduced to that mechanic in uh, in the uh, Arkham Horror. Uh, you know, like it's scales up difficulty f- per player and it's really yeah. cool to see that in here where you guys are using that not just for like threat levels or something like that you know like when you see it on um or, or strength sorry uh yeah so um when it's on uh when it was on the weapon attachment i was like oh my god this is this is ridiculous yeah, yeah, it gets a lot of counters in a four-player game. Yeah, yeah like wow. twelve ammo counters or something. Else. But he's spinning them real quick because he's he's shooting at everybody as as he activates. Yeah, no, I I love crossbones. I'm really excited to get to get a hold of crossbones, and actually, I'm really really excited to see Taskmaster. Uh, yeah, Taskmaster. I have to be honest. Taskmaster is like the one that I'm like most nervous about. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. just because like <laughs> like i'm familiar with the character and and I, I i like the scenario don't get me wrong i'm not nervous that it's not a good scenario but since we announced taskmaster the anticipation for that character is like through the roof i was like really when did taskmaster become like the most popular villain in like the mcu or something like <laughs> really yeah so, that's that's crazy like he looks really good in the in the black widow trailer i can't wait to see that movie 
Um, so yeah, he's got an interesting power set, right? Like he has the ability to mimic other heroes. So, you know, he famously carries around a bow, just like Hawkeye, a shield, like cap, a sword, like uh swordsman, you know, he's, he, he's definitely, uh, you know, loaded for war. Yep. We need, but that, we need Deadpool imagine, now to, to try fight to him. imagine a more challenging villain to represent his powers though, because his powers are mimicking your powers. <laughs> Right, yeah. you know, so like, what are you, what are you gonna do? Like, is he gonna, you know, is, is he gonna gain the actual hero like abilities? Like, that just wouldn't work. You know what I mean? Like, that just wouldn't work in the game. You you can't open that Pandora's box and expect <laughs> that to play out just fine. Okay, close you know? that one. Can't close like that. that, that just ain't gonna happen. Uh, so we definitely wanted to do some stuff though that represented like his his mimicry. And so I actually think it's a card called mimicry. I, I can't remember. It's basically a treachery that's like. When you reveal it, you're going to mill your deck a little bit. And if you discard, like, an attack card, he's going to attack you. If you discard, like, a thwart card, then he's going to scheme or something like that. Where it's pretty much like his behavior will be determined by what you have in your deck. So there's a little bit of that mimicry there. But wow, his that's, ability, that's interesting. His, his main villain ability, though, actually has more to do about his role in the story. Uh, where... He's going around like Hydra has like conquered the United States, and now he he is going door to door with his Hydra hit squad, like hunting down heroes. Um, and so his whole thing is like, um, the longer you stay in hero form, like the more danger you're in. Uh, but he's gonna hit you every time you flip back or something. I, I don't remember all the specifics of it because the fact of the matter is my memory's getting worse as I get older. <laughs> and I work on a lot of scenarios. Yeah, so yeah. I'm like, I can't no remember problem. all the specifics exactly. Anyway, I just I hope he lands for for Taskmaster fans because uh, we had a lot of fun developing him. Um, and honestly, I can't remember all the cards in his kit right now. But there's a really cool sub theme of like like I said, story wise, because ultimately these are story boxes. You know that we're trying to. There are five individual scenarios you can play standalone, but they can also be connected together to tell a story. And we included a comic book, you know, that tells you what's going on in between. And um, so his his particular scenario I was really excited about because it's where, for me, the story really takes off. You know, like Crossbones attacking a Pegasus facility, that feels real straightforward. You know, Absorbing Man trying to delay the heroes from pursuing you know, Madam Hydra who got away, like that's also pretty straightforward. But all of a sudden, wait, Hydra rules the United States? Like what does that look like? Like now now we're getting into it. You know, Taskmaster's yeah. now like chief of police. What? Like <laughs> what's going on here? Uh so we have like side schemes that pop up and, and when they, they're like, you know, a captive hero and you can like rescue heroes or or allies rather, like by defeating that side scheme. And there's like specific allies that come with the scenario that that are only playable like when you're playing that scenario unless you're playing campaign mode and you rescue them then then you can put them in your deck for the rest of the campaign oh that's so, so awesome yeah i really i really enjoyed that so that that's what i mean when i say like a, a part of his scenario is uh it's like equal parts focused on him and the story yeah right. and and those were i was alluding to the fact that you know when 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 I hear something like, oh my god, Taskmaster's going to be in there, and I think about what Taskmaster does, and I'm like, I don't know. My mind is just like, how, the, how are they going to pull this off? What <laughs> what are you possibly going to do? And then, you know, you say stuff like that, and it just gets me even more excited that, that you guys are able to link cool. the, the, the theme and the gameplay. So I, I really feel like we're driving a, a, a living card uh, comic book, you know, so to speak, so... You know, building. Yeah, I'm so excited for people to see that comic too. Like that's something that that uh that was something that I pitched that I'm really proud of. Like it it if it seems like such a natural thing to do, which is usually the best ideas feel like they fit hand in glove, but it doesn't mean that someone necessarily thinks of them right away. You know, mm -hmm. so we were pretty well into the development process when it occurred to me like I was starting to write the story. You know, and 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 in both Lord of the Rings and Arkham, we just write it. You know, we just write it and put it in the rules. Um, and I'm starting to write, and I'm going, why am I writing a story for a comic book game? Like, there should be a comic <laughs> book game to show me what happens. And uh, and so I pitched that, and everybody got on board right away. They were like, that's awesome. Yeah, we should totally commission. And so I hope, I hope fans appreciate that, because ultimately, you know, we could have just written a story, and you'd mm -hmm. still get the same number of scenarios. But we shelled out a little more, you know, to hire, you know, hire an artist. We spent a little more time, like, 
you know, writing um, comic scripts for the artist to to illustrate, you know, just because we want to bring you that experience. Mm-hmm. So I, I really hope people enjoy mm-hmm. them because I'm I'm really happy with how they turned mm-hmm. out. They look really cool. Is there two? Is there two comic books per box? No, what it what it is? It's, because because um, then that means I'll never get to enjoy it. Because my son will, and I open it, it's it, oh, yeah. it, gone. Right? So, so I got you. I got you. I, I won't be able to ever tell you what it's like. I'll 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 get him to to explain it to you one day. Well, we'll have to make the PDF available online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See it. See it. Log um, in to FFG. I'll and never see it. The rules. It, it would have I mean, been one of those we'll, things if you told me, you're like, oh, and the comic book in there. I'm like, there was a comic? <laughs> yeah. Wait, what? No, it's actually the comics are, are in the rules document. Yeah. So they're not, it's not a separate thing. It's actually like, so if you played any of our other like LCG expansions, you'll be, be like, welcome to the, you know, Rise mm-hmm. of Red Skull expansion. Here's everything that's in it. New icons, new keywords, right? Turn the page, you know, um, you know, scenario one, blah, 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 here's what's happening. But instead of getting that, you know, just brief overview, you get, you turn the page and there's, you know, Nick Fury calling up the Avengers uh, in the comic book. Like, we spoiled that page. Yeah. Um, you, so, I, I, for me, that just kind of brought it to that next yeah. level. Do you feel, yeah, like, giddy so awesome. like that? Like, you're like, I want to go back and tell, like, you know, seven-year-old Caleb, like, you're going to be making comics one day, man. Little bit, <laughs> little bit. I mean, clearly, clearly I'm not, you know, Chris Claremont or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like a, a Marvel writer at this point. I'm, I'm writing comic book scripts with my favorite comic book heroes in them you know they're not gonna they're not gonna blow anyone's minds you know they're deliberately uh campy they're 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 for me they're kind of a callback to uh to the 1984 secret wars you know kind of this idea of like the story is mostly an excuse for these people to fight you know but Mm -hmm. you know you get you get to hear cap shout avengers assemble and you get to see them go into action and it's a lot of fun that's sweet Cool. Um, I guess this one other like quick thing is I can probably speak for myself and Jameson that we're both super hyped for uh, Spider Woman as yeah. the hero in there. She seems so incredibly unique as far as just being able to build and create, and actually seems like the deck brewers like type of hero to really like push all the combinations they can play with. So that's just a really neat another like out of the box like design that's like pretty pretty amazing. Cool. Yes, yeah, so that that's another one that uh, you know kind of went through a metamorphosis, uh, and and ultimately Box was the driver behind that, and did a really great job. Nate was the one who who felt very strongly from the beginning, like we need to get a hero who breaks the deck building rules in, like very early into the game. Like mm-hmm. we we want a hero that can have two aspects, like ASAP, you know. Um, and so for us, our challenge became like who can do this? Who makes the most sense? like right away and there was some talk about hulk you know like with the bruce banner hulk dichotomy like would it make sense for him to like he can always have aggression and maybe have another and uh we you know we kind of were interested to explore that idea but ultimately uh we 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 scaled back from that because we thought you know hulk is really going to resonate with a lot of our younger audience you know like you know, people that uh, just want to smash things, you know? And so we're like, ultimately, let's keep Hulk, like, just a little more straightforward. And uh, and so when we started talking about who was going to go into the story box, you know, it's got this Hydra theme, this Avenger theme, and uh, Hawkeye's a real high-profile Avenger right now, and uh, one of the oldest Avengers, too. So we're like, for sure, we want to get Hawkeye in there. And then, uh, then it was like, you know, Jessica Drew, Spider-Woman, she makes a lot of sense. She's got this uh, weird connection to Hydra. Um, and, and right away, we're like, you know, she, her connection to Hydra is that she was like a double agent for a while. Like, double agent. That sounds like two aspects. You know, let's, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> it's, let's make it happen. It was there yeah. all along. Staring yeah, in the so face. That, that, was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, her powers, her powers are interesting, right? Because, like... She just kind of does a lot of different things. She can. She doesn't fly. She can glide. She can like zap people. Like shoot. Like uh, you know these uh, energy zaps. Um, one of her like weirder powers is she can like emit pheromones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of make guys a little dizzy around her. You know. Um, so she's not necessarily defined by like one thing, right? Oh, and she sticks to walls, and that's why she's Spider Woman. You know, but she doesn't like shoot webs or anything. So it's like, yeah, she's kind of like all over the place in terms of her power set. So that gives us a lot of freedom for how we want to interpret that. So we, we decided to really 
focus in again on on kind of the dual agent identity and and uh, say yeah her power is to have dual dual aspects and uh, and then of course once you have that it's like well how do you play with those in her set how about yeah. when the, like what went through your head when with the amount of stuff that you could have done with all of Clint's arrow set uh, I know oh, that, that that was the easiest one to design ever. Oh, yeah. It really was. Like <laughs> I was almost worried. I was almost worried that he would be boring because he's a guy with arrows. You know, like that's not that's not like the crazy. It's not like Doctor Strange where he can do all these different the different spells and everything. It's like no, he just he shoots arrows. Um, but really, Matt Newman was like super encouraging because he he picked up like an early version that I made and he was like, "This is my favorite hero." He's like, I love how focused he is. His kit is so focused. Like, he was like, you should do more heroes that are this focused. And I was like, really? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> I was just so encouraged by his reaction. Like, definitely, I didn't approach him going, oh, he's just a guy with bow and arrows. He's so boring. Right. Like, I'm, I am excited about him. I was just more yeah. like worried, you know, that that maybe. And there probably are people out there, honestly, who are going to go, yeah, I, I don't care about playing hot guy. He's just a dude with bow and arrow. But uh, for me, it's all about his quiver. His quiver is what really like makes it work, and again, Matt kind of pitched in there a little bit. Where um, I think originally the quiver was some kind of scrying ability, but Matt was like, "No, man, I want to be able to take an arrow from my hand and put it in the quiver and save it for later." And I was like, "Yeah, that sounds right." <laughs> so yeah, you can you can load up all of his all of his arrows are events, right? They're all either attack or thwart events. Um, so if you have one in your hand that you don't want to shoot that turn, you can. Put it in his quiver. Load it. Save it for later. Yeah. You know, uh, his ability, I love his ability, is just you exhaust him to ready his bow. Because, of course, you have to exhaust the bow to fire an arrow. So you can exhaust him to ready the bow and fire another arrow, get that quick shot in there. Mm. Yeah, he, he's fun. Yeah, and it was interesting to, to see that, um, I think it's been confirmed that they, they said that there's five new keywords that will appear in the expansion, but we've only known of two of them. We know uh, range... Yeah. Uh, and, ig- ignores well, retaliate and piercing, uh, you know, goes through tough. So I'm really excited to see what you guys are building there. Um, is that right? Is there five? I, can't I don't know. This is, this is just what I was reading. And, and from... I know there's insight. We have the insight keyword, which maybe hasn't been spoiled yet. Uh, that was uh, on the Kang. It was on the Once and Future yeah, Kang. I think yeah, and that's just there. that uh, for a long time we honestly called it Doomed because it basically works the same as Doom <laughs> in, uh, in Lord of the Rings. Um, and and really, I was like, I went with Doomed because that's what it was mimicking. And I was like, if someone comes up with something better, it's fine. But, you know, mm-hmm. Doom doesn't feel horribly inappropriate for Marvel. We do have Dr. Doom. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, but eventually someone suggested Insight. And I was like, yeah, that works. That's a good that's a good word for that. So I know I know we have that one. And to me, that's just a really versatile uh, keyword. You can throw it on anything. You know, if you have a treachery that's like, really not that punchy and almost feels like it's too soft to reveal well give it in sight you know or a minion you have a guard minion you're like we have a lot of guard minions what makes this one different well this one has in sight you know like <laughs> yeah well i'll always throw in i appreciate you guys using keywords and taking advantage of keyords because <laughs> the other thing that we've always complained about we used to look at like old school like netrunner netrunner had so many keywords that never got utilized for anything. <laughs> okay, and, sure, yeah. sure. Like, yeah, <laughs> traits and keywords. And, we are a little guilty. Yeah. We we did put uh, the peril keyword in the in the core set. That was something <laughs> where uh, you know we were just looking at like stuff that already existed in other games. And I remember Nate saying he liked the peril keyword. So we, you know, kind of like little history lesson, we originally came with the peril keyword in Lord of the Rings with the first uh, Lord of the Rings saga box, the Black Riders. And, and the you know, in Lord of the Rings, you don't get individual encounter cards. Like, you just, if there's four people, you just reveal four cards. It's not any one person doing it, but we mm-hmm. changed that for the saga expansions. Now it was deal it out to each person, and then peril was like, when you resolve this, you can't ask for help. You can't tell people what it is. It made it more personal. And Nate was reflecting on it going, you know, I like that a lot. Like, I wish we kind of thought of this when we first designed the game. He's like, I would go back and I would I would change the way encounter cards are dealt to, to do it this way where it's more personal. 
Um, so we said, all right, we'll, we'll make Marvel like that. We'll, you know, deal out the encounter cards and we'll just put the peril keyword in there. And then I don't think we used it. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's coming. <laughs> yeah, know? that's right. But it, but it's always available now. It's like always got there it. for us. So. But it's cool because you guys are taking advantage of stuff like Spy. Like Spy was one that like I used a bunch. And so there's all these like small ones, you know, like the Avengers trait, obviously. But it's just good to see when those there, there's stuff that like will buddy off of it or you have that that door open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like partner off of it. Yeah, and and to go back there, it, it really I'm really kind of not excited to you know to hear you talk about Hawkeye like that, right? Um, about how you said Matt, you know, came to you and he's like, "This is my favorite hero," and you were surprised by it. I I have been pleasantly surprised, and you guys have caught me off guards with some of the heroes that I was kind of like, "Meh." I mean, I'm gonna buy the pack because I'm. You know, I'm, I'm a collector, and I, I need... There's probably, like, one or two aspect cards in there, but I'm not... The hero is And we not, love you for that. The hero is not... <laughs> doing that. Keep doing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Keep telling your friends to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, there's some heroes out there that I was just like, nah, no, I'm not too excited by, and and, and it was because I didn't... They weren't my... You know, I wasn't pretending to be that hero on the playground growing up, right? So yeah, it's, yeah, it's not what like, you grew up. With. No, yeah. it's normal. It's but, normal, uh, right? You I get mean, more excited about the ones you recognize. There, there's some ones that and, and mechanics that once they were spoiled, I'm like, nah, cool. But then I'm like, oh my god, this is this is ridiculously fun to play, and uh, mm-hmm. get, you know, you, you give it a test run. So it's that whole judge a book by its cover thing that I've I've been surprised once I'm actually going through and playing it or thinking about. How am I going to build this deck? What what aspect am I going to pair this with? And uh, you know, um, I, I've just really appreciated what you guys have done for these these hero designs and, and even the villains uh, that have come in there, um, you know, to to challenge us and the whole modular stuff. The right? way I can take, I, I mean, I've even taken some some ones that aren't modular sets and just crammed them in and made them modular <laughs> sets or sure. uh, you know nemesis villains right like you know i've oh, take yeah. it, taken a modular set that probably shouldn't have been done and i'm like now nah, this is my nemesis today right so um sure. it, it's been it's just been a fun system to to muck around with and very pleasantly surprised with what you guys have put together thank you i'm really glad you enjoyed it uh cory you have anything else to kind of touch on from rise of red skull and all of that pieces no, I think uh, we, we've covered pretty much everything. Um, so the big thing is, you know, thank you so much, Caleb, for answering, letting us sit here and yeah. ask you questions for going on almost two hours now. Yeah, so. sure. <laughs> uh, I, I will say the one thing that, like, as I don't want to ask you about, you know, what's your favorite villain or what's your favorite hero? Like, when we talk about thematic or, or the Marvel Universe, because then people are going to be like, oh, he really loves this villain. It's going to be coming soon in the next pack. Uh, or, or, you know, so I, I don't want to lead people on like that. But um, talking about... Uh, how much you love Marvel, right? Like, I mean, it, it comes through, man, and it, it really does. Thank you. Uh, you know, I mean, you're sitting there wearing a Marvel, uh, you know, shirt. Can you even see it? Yeah. I don't even know. No. I just saw the, I just saw the, the Hulk, I saw the Hulk punch coming up. Uh, you know, yeah. we, we had uh, we had Spider Man guest appear at the beginning of the stream. Uh, you, you know, looked <laughs> yeah, like he was all decked out. I, I forgot my son was wearing his Spider-Man pajamas. <laughs> right, so, so, I mean, I can see I'll that. let you know that uh, his grandparents bought those. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, my obsession okay. doesn't necessarily, like, override my kids, you know, wardrobe. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm surprised you haven't seen seen anybody pack behind it. If it was earlier, you'd see somebody all of a sudden show up in full Black Panther gear. Yes. You know, got the Nerf <laughs> the nerf claws and the, and the blasters and stuff like that. They just love to play awesome. pretend dress up so i i know that you are you know you call your the geek the nerd uh, uh for all of this stuff and just drinking it in dream come true project probably um but when they when marvel or disney now was, you know gave you the key to the art database can you just can you <laughs> can you talk about that like how long did you just spend hitting next looking like matching so, card you know, arts up what- and and stuff like Seeing the, all of that stuff, I feel like it's just a like a fan dream come true, and like you're given the you know the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, right? I think I think it's maybe not as exciting as as you think it is. Uh, 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 <laughs> really, uh, <laughs> what what it is is like it, it's almost random what's on there and what's not, right? 
So there, we've kind of backed ourselves into a corner on a couple occasions, me and Boggs, where, you know, part of our job is we have to write the art briefs, right? <laughs> so, and, and when we're looking at a set, we kind of have to figure out, all right, what are we going to order art for? And what do we think we can find pickup for? Right. Because uh, like like we've uh, I've said before, like when when you're making a game based on the Marvel license, of course, you're going to use that Marvel art because it's the best in the world. Right. But we also want to present something new. Right. Especially for our story uh, driven elements that, you know, in order to tell the story we want to tell, we're going to have to commission some new art. So it's a balance. And uh, so Box and I will kind of go down the list and go, yeah, we'll write a uh, brief for that. No, that we can probably find. And sometimes you think there's stuff that's like, uh, yeah, we'll be able to. No, did we freeze? Did you freeze, Corey? Oh, we lost him right at the end. Find that. Oh, he's back. Are you guys still there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are we there? You no, we can hear you. We can there. hear you now. You kind of like my screen just up. went black. <laughs> I have no idea. Of, like maybe my screensaver was kicking in or something. I don't know. Uh, I was crazy. You, you, you know what? I my computer you're... is like, dude, that's enough out of you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> These guys <Yeah>. a break. <laughs> I think maybe your you camera's for us, off, yeah. I will. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh uh, yeah. Sorry. I yeah. I was just saying. Like uh, we we've kind of we we've had a couple of close calls where. We thought we were going to find art in that database, and then it wasn't there. Like, it, it does seem a little bit random, like, what you can find and what you can't find. <laughs> you know, characters that you think are, like, real popular, and they'll, oh, there'll be, uh, you know, dozens of pieces. Nope, you, you got one. And, and and they're, like, off to the side. You know, <laughs> and we're like, oh, crap, now what do we do? You know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's it's fun to have access to. It's an incredible resource for us. We do We do find a lot of art pick up uh from there we also um have a freelancer we work with who whose job is kind of go through marvel unlimited and uh and find art that will help us and then we have a submission process where we can send sort of like comic book issue copyright date page number panel kind of descriptions and then they can send it back to us you know without any text bubbles and high res versions mm -hmm. uh so, we, yeah, we have some cool uh, means at our disposal, but really I can't talk about the art without just giving a shout-out to our art department, and, and particularly uh, Deb Garcia is our, our, our primary um, art director for this game, and she just does a fantastic job. So with, without the, the support of the art team, uh, you yeah. know, the game wouldn't look mm. as good as it does. No, I, I love the fact that it's like so many different styles that you guys pick from, right? It's not like, it's not like that one look. Right, like you, you get the goblin. Yeah. You get like two different kind of green goblin like art styles and stuff. And it, it's it's been it's been phenomenal to see as a, as a fan of somebody who grew up with the comic books through the ages, the golden age. You know, all of that. You know, up to the new stuff to see so many different art styles put in. Because I mean, that's what comics were is you yeah. know eighty percent art, right? Like, and, and, right. and the, and well, the it's a characters. visual medium for yeah. sure. So and and I'm glad to well. hear you enjoy the diversity because I I know very early on there was some discussion of trying to have a more uniform art style. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at uh, Keyforge or Lord of the Rings or Arkham, they you know very uniform in their style. And having worked on Lord of the Rings for as long as I appreciate it, it was appropriate for that game to have all the art look like you know it 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 um, was all very similar in style. But one of the things that makes Marvel Comics so great and appeal to such a variety of people is that there is such a variety of art. You know, mm -hmm. that uh, art that I, you know, can barely look at is someone else's favorite. And stuff that's my favorite, other people are like, ah, it's overdone. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so it really is beauty in the eye of the beholder. And I'm glad that we were able to embrace that in our game and, and get that diverse um, art look to it. Did they do anything for you? Like, were you able to go? Did you get to go to um, HQ, like Marvel headquarters? I know. Oh man, I wanted to so bad. Like, so kind of a funny story. Um, like when we were developing the game, and it was the team, you know, Nate and myself and and Boggs, the three of us. Um, we knew at some point one of us was going to have to carry the torch and and make the pitch. And uh, Nate is, uh, you know, brilliant card game designer, but he, he's not a huge um, public speaking, you know, face-to-face, uh, -face, by his own admission. That's yeah. not his favorite thing to do. 
And, uh, and I think Boggs just kind of looked at me and was like, well, you are way more passionate about this IP right now than I like, he's a, you know, he's a Marvel fan too, but I think he just saw me like chomping at the bit, yeah, yeah. you know? So I was sort of like elected the guy to, uh, to, to go and make the pitch. And, uh, so when they said, yep, we're going to go to, to Marvel, we're going to make the pitch. I was thinking New York city, you know, Marvel comics, you know, publishing <laughs> house, like I'm going to meet Joe Quesada and hey. it's going to be. <laughs> and it's like no we're going to la we're going to uh disney corporate headquarters we're going to meet with their licensing team and uh, don't get me wrong these are fantastic people it's just uh it, yeah it wasn't marvel hq <laughs> it, it wasn't like <laughs> was it the, the house of dreams you know <laughs> or ideas right like, like I, i'm applying for three different credit cards right now because i'm buying all of the merchandise as you're going in <laughs> come, you, you were ready to just come home with with the next seven year Christmas gifts for the kids, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I would. I'm still kind of holding out hope that somehow I'll, I'll end up being invited to uh, to go over to uh, you know Marvel Comics uh, Publishing House and 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 see uh, you know behind the curtain. But uh, as it was, uh, that was that's the only time I've been to LA. That was pretty well, nice. I, was I would say good. that it's probably a re it could probably going to be a reality once this lifts, right? Like I, I think that the game's doing well <laughs> enough and stuff. And, and, hey, they, you guys have done stuff. Have special Star Wars days where you've had like um, you know um, people that are immersed in the Star Wars universe down at the Fantasy Flight headquarters. Um, you know, novelists, people that have done work on that ip and and big names uh damon got to talk with uh you know george when he was doing um game of thrones there so i you know pretty soon you'll probably have uh you know mcfarland's cell phone number on speed dial and when you're doing the venom <laughs> module you know and uh then then you can come back and tell us all about how how todd mcfarland is <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't think he's worked for Marvel in decades. <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean, I think you need to you need to go and research that though. That the Venom's, <laughs> Venom's creator. I think I think he would be awesome uh, to talk to. I'd get him to like scribble on any napkin he can. I'm like, just draw me something, man. It's actually funny you you, you mentioned McFarland specifically because I actually just watched a, a little documentary uh, about him on uh, on YouTube from the uh, Sci Fi Channel. You guys ever see the on YouTube the yeah. Sci-Fi Channel? Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about because I heard some of the people talk about. It. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Yeah, it's on it's, my radar. I'm I'm not. Uh, I got nothing against him. I'm not. I'm not the hugest McFarland fan. I'm more of a Jim Lee fan. Um, but it was a very interesting, um, you know, documentary to watch. I think the inspiration for the timing of it was uh, Spawn issue 300. Mm. You know, you know that was happening, and that's a huge milestone. I think it's only the second independent comic to hit 300 issues yeah i was just gonna say he's done a lot for for standalone Pretty as an deal. independent uh you know yeah. bringing that up but, I, but it's I, kind of funny you mentioned him in the context of marvel because you know he makes it really clear through, <laughs> through the documentary like he's not having anything to do with marvel ever again yeah no but you know what's weird though is that uh, the only reason i bring it up is because he's he's in interviews and stuff like that, he seems so defensive over the Venom character, right? Like, I remember watching uh, interviews with him uh, when the movie came out, and he was like, he's very quick to to tell you if, if he approves of, of how the, the direction they've taken Venom in this, or uh, I've seen sure. other interviews where, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's Venom-related stuff, and he's very quick to give his opinion on it. It's almost like you have to appease Todd McFarlane to actually get the blessing to, to do anything Venom, right? <laughs> that's And that's just the way it comes off to me in He's, he's right? definitely a person of strong opinions. Yes. Yeah, right. and he says as much about himself, <laughs> yeah. you know, in, yeah. the, so, so in the documentary. That's the only reason I say that they'd have to, like, for you to, you know, I, I feel like, oh, for you to do ve the Venom pack, that you're going to have to go out and, and get Todd's blessing, and Todd's going to be in some interview with Joe Rogan one day being like, yeah, Caleb, <laughs> Caleb totally butchered my character, man, when they put me in this this game. Uh, wow. Well, we went deep. We went deep into the I would I would pay money to watch that episode. <laughs> I'd be like, wait, he's on a podcast talking about me? Yeah. yeah. He would, man. He would. Because I, like I said, he's very. That guy knows every obscure Venom thing that comes out. It's almost like he's got like a Google search hit thing on that. If somebody says something about Venom, he's he's on it, right? So interesting. 
Yeah, look no, for I did his not know that about him on this episode coming and I, soon. And I only so. know that because, like I said, like Venom's my my top of the top since I was a kid. Like I love that yeah. character design. I love so I'm I'm for me that one is is the one that I've got my eye out when when that comes. And obviously, yeah, I got a I got a buddy uh, who helps me play test, and like Venom's kind of his guy too, right? Like yeah, yeah. I honestly I remember the comics, right? Like in the '90s when I was getting into comics, that's that's when he was introduced. I remember it was a big deal because, like, Spider Man's spider sense didn't work on Venom. He couldn't sense mm-hmm. him coming, and that was really exciting. But that's kind of like where my interest began and ended. You know, like, I, I always thought he kind of looked silly, <laughs> you know, with the more the more his mouth opened up and the tongue came out, like, from a mile long. And, um, but I got a buddy who absolutely loves him. And uh, honestly, for me, Venom got most interesting when, uh, when it wasn't Eddie Brock, but it was Flash Thompson. Oh wow! Venom? Yeah, yeah. How do you yeah. how do you feel about Flash Thompson, uh, Agent Venom? I, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was very interesting story arcs in line, and even when he uh, he um, was switched over to uh, oh, what's the dude's name that was the original Scorpion? Uh, oh, Gargan. Yeah, yeah, yeah Gargan. Right. So yeah, yeah. That- I, re- I read that one too. So I had a I, I I'm not a big Spider Man collector, but I I did pick up. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it's basically like Green Goblin gets like every worst Spider-Man villain ever, right? To gang up, and and one of them is uh, Max Gargan as as Venom. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the the and, mob uh, boss's son, mm-hmm. right? So yeah, and I uh, I so I didn't collect Spider-Man or Venom, but I I did collect Guardians for a long time, right? Guardians of the Galaxy. And uh, I noticed they they kind of did this right when they went, right before they launched the new the first movie, mm. they rebooted the comics. That's kind of Marvel's thing now, right? If a movie's coming out, they're gonna relaunch the book, right? Was that the person. was that the Dan Abnett line? There was no, like the that series. came before. That came, yeah. and that's really great stuff. I love that. Yeah, stuff. that that's the when I actually first started like reading Guardians was his because I knew him from. Uh, warhammer novels he used to do like sure. back in the day and so like i mean like recognize like oh he's writing this and yeah andy andy book. lanning and dan abnett they've done some yeah. fantastic they're kind of like the top names in cosmic marvel right yeah. and uh so what happened for me i discovered those books after i picked up i think it was i think it was bendis my, brian michael bendis was started writing guardians and it was uh Steve McNiven did the first few issues, and then it was uh, Sheedy, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, uh, took over after. Really, really great art, really great story, and uh, they, they kind of used Iron Man to, like, uh, propel the book forward a little bit. They, they brought Iron, Iron Man joined the Guardians for a short stretch, and then they're like, that was a good idea, let's put another Avenger, let's put yeah. more you know, uh, recognizable heroes on the Guardians uh, one at a time, so like Ant-Man joined for a minute. And then, uh, then it was Agent Venom, and that was the first time I'd read Venom in a book in years. I hadn't, Look and I was like, that, "Whoa, eh? Venom looks a lot different now. He's got <laughs> yeah. like, he's he's packing heat. See, people, he's got tactical yeah. gear. Like yeah. this guy looks really interesting to me. He's still Venom, right? He's still doing the Venom stuff, but he's got like, he's like a member of Shield or something now. Like he, it, I just it, thought that was it, really it gets interesting. Whack, and that's what that's what's good about comics, right? See the yeah. the game is in good hands when when you, when we go this far down the rabbit hole. So, uh, uh, Caleb, thank you so much, man. We we appreciate this. We appreciate being able to talk about the the lore and the characters and stuff like that on that kind of deep level where you're you know pulling these throwbacks and referencing the artists and stuff like that. It really really shows, man, that your 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 cool. heart's in the right place and we got good people behind the scenes. Well, I hope we prove that true. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for everybody else that was tuning in, watching. Uh, Corey, unless you got something else, I'm I'm fresh out. Nah, man. Well, thanks to everyone who tuned in and like watched all the way through. Hope you enjoyed it. A lot of cool information that came through. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Thank you, and we'll catch you on the next one. <laughs>